And now we come to the book of Revelation and chapter 13. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, we have, of course, a whole variety of beasts that are delineated for us. And we believe that the beasts of Revelation 13 are rightly related to the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. Actually, we can tell that quite easily because do you know that if you look at the cross references in the margin of Revelation chapter 13, you'll find Daniel 7, Daniel 7, Daniel 7, Daniel 7, turning up over and over and over again throughout the length and breadth of Revelation chapter 13. We're being told, brothers and sisters, that the idea of the beasts of Revelation 13 are drawn from a previous prophecy, which of course is Daniel chapter 7. Now, what do we have then in Revelation 13? Well, we've got four different beasts or powers enumerated. We've got the dragon of verse 2. We've got the beast of the sea of verse 1. We've got the beast of the earth of verse 11. And we've got the image of the beast of, uh, of verses 14 and 15. And I think that in Revelation 13, we have both the idea of sequential movement and also of concurrent existence. Now, let me explain what I mean. Do you notice how in Revelation 12, verse 17, it says the dragon was wroth with the woman. So the dragon is in existence. And then chapter 13, verse 1 says, I saw the beast of the sea. I saw the sand of the sea and the beast rise up out of the sea. And the dragon, verse 2, gave him his power. So I think that what we assume from that, and rightly so, is that the dragon in this case existed before the beast of the sea in order to give power to the beast of the sea. And likewise, in verse 11, it says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast that came before him. So there is some idea of sequence, isn't there, in Revelation chapter 13. And yet I think also that the symbols of Revelation 13 are to be treated as concurrent symbols. Because if the dragon of verse 2 gives power to the beast of the sea in verse 2, then we assume that both the dragon and the beast are alive at the same time. And if the beast of the earth of Daniel chapter 13 and verse, uh, verse 10 exercises power before or in the presence of the first beast in verse 12, then we assume that both the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth are likewise in existence at the same time. And if the beast of the earth has power in verse 15 to give life unto the image of the beast, then we assume that both the beast of the earth and the image of the beast are likewise alive at the same time. So, so what do we have then in Revelation chapter 13? What we've got, brothers and sisters, is the story of Daniel's fourth beast and the outworking of its history in Europe. So here's a chart that many of you might be familiar with that seeks now to essentially locate the beasts of Revelation chapter 13 in their relative positions upon the European continent. So we have the dragon of the east based in Constantinople, we have the beast of the sea, that is in the, in the westernmost portion of Europe, the beast of the earth to the north of that, and the image of the beast to the south of that in the area of Italy. Now, I'm only going to talk about the two beasts this morning, brothers and sisters, just the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. The beast of the sea has relationship to things Mediterranean. And you'll notice that what the chart shows is that the beast of the sea was considered to be the Mediterranean countries, but especially France. France and the Latin kingdoms, which embraced the Iberian Peninsula. The heart of the, of the beast of the sea was in the territory of France. Now, France, of course, is Goma. So that's one of the sons of Japheth. Now, the beast of the earth of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 obviously comes from a different location because we're told that this is the beast of the earth and not the beast of the sea. And we believe that the phrase, the beast of the earth, in Revelation chapter 13 has reference to the land mass of central Europe and that the beast of the earth is essentially Germany and the Holy Roman Empire collaborating with the papacy. But if the beast of the earth is Germany, then that's Magog. 
So the remarkable thing about the Beast of Revelation chapter 13 is that one of them is essentially France or Goma and the other is essentially Germany or Mago, the sons of Japheth. We're at the very center of the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. And in fact, that's what happened, because historically, as we come through the history of Europe, we find that there were two mighty kingdoms that developed in parallel to one another. There was a kingdom called Neustria, which was centered in France, and a kingdom called Austrasia, which was centered in Germany. In their totality, these two kingdoms became the Frankish domain, but they were always separate in a sense. There was always a sense of division. Even when they were temporarily united together, as they were on certain notable occasions, they inevitably fell apart into two quite distinct kingdoms that relate to the territories of ancient Goma and ancient Magog. Of course, there was a man who united them together in his realm. Who was the man who brought together the two territories in his realm? And the answer is, of course, the man called Charlemagne. It was Charlemagne that ruled over both of them. And since the days of Charlemagne, there's always been a European dream for an empire that would combine the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, a union of Magog and Goma, Japheth's older sons. Now, I'm just going to take you now through some history from the time of Charlemagne onwards, just to see what happened in terms of, well, more particularly the Holy Roman Empire, but to see how that France and Germany were clearly seen to be two distinct units in the history of Europe. So then here's our first map. Now this is the Holy Roman Empire in the year 814. This is the year that Charlemagne died. Notice the extent of Charlemagne's empire. He combined together the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea. He ruled over the whole of France and the whole of Germany and the whole of Central Europe. His kingdom extended just a little southwards into Spain and southwards also into the Italian peninsula. And the two great centers of the Holy Roman Empire in Charlemagne's day were Aachen to the north, which was the civil or secular capital, and Rome to the south, which was of course the spiritual capital. But you see, that uniting of Goma and Magog that occurred briefly in the days of Charlemagne didn't last, brothers and sisters, because, well, let me show you what happened in subsequent history. Now we come to the time of the Holy Roman Empire in 1189. Now we've come to the death of Frederick I, Frederick Barbarossa, one of the greatest emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, you notice what's happened to the extent and size of the empire. It's shrunk into Central Europe. Where has it shrunk away from? It's shrunk away from France. It's moved away from France and moved eastwards into the whole area of Europe and perhaps a little beyond Europe itself. So there was a distinction emerging here between France, which would be in history a quite separate kingdom, and Germany, which would be the Holy Roman Empire. Because of course, the Holy Roman Empire later became known the Holy Roman Empire of the German people. Or oh, you notice the capitals changed as well. The civil capital has moved from Aachen now to Frankfurt. It's becoming thoroughly Germanic in its character. The spiritual capital is still Rome, but there's been a change. Well, let's move on a little first. So now we come to the death of Maximilian. We're another two or three hundred years later on in history. And you see what's happened now to the Holy Roman Empire. It's virtually completely moved out of France and is now thoroughly Germanic in its character, but also in its territory. And you'll notice how that the, 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 uh, the western border of the empire is virtually down the dividing line between France and Germany that we see today. This is the emergence of the Franco-German border, the ancient dividing line between Magog and Goma. It's been, well, we know that it was the work and the responsibility of Napoleon to pour out judgments upon the beast and that, that Revelation 16 is largely the story of the work of the vials that the beast system of Europe might be judged. In fact, we might say that the beast came to an end with the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, which occurred in what year? Anyone know what year it was? 
1806, absolutely correct. On the 6th of August, to be precise, if I remember correctly, because on that day the emperor abdicated his title as emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And one could truly say that in a sense, the beast system had come to an end at that time, 1800. And yet the remarkable thing is that the Bible and particularly the book of Revelation clearly tells us that there will be a beast system at the time of the end.